All right, guys, so we're giving you a couple of breaks just so that you can sort of rest your minds because we're about to deep dive now. This is going to be like the most intense part of tonight. Um, and hopefully you walk away with some new knowledge from this next session. All right? So the first lesson of Star AI, Epsilon Greedy, your first reinforcement learning uh, algorithm, or what we, like to, what we like to call in reinforcement learning agent, kind of like a matrix. Right, so this session is going to consist of five parts. The first part is going to, going to talk a little bit about a toy problem called the, called the multi-arm bandit problem. And we'll jump into what that actually means in a couple of minutes, two minutes. We'll then dive into uh, what is known as exploration versus exploitation, the concept here. It's crucial for you to understand this, for you to then be able to understand Epsilon Greedy. We'll then talk a little, a little bit about how uh, Epsilon Greedy solves the exploitation versus exploration problem. We then, then got to go on a detour, a little bit of a di diversion, and talk about open AI gym and why it's important. And finally, we're going to wrap this all together in an exercise. We're going to solve the multi-armed bandit problem using Epsilon Greedy in open AI gym. So there's quite a bit here to cover. So let's get to it. So. The reason we teach you Epsilon Greedy again is this idea that like, we try to give core pieces of knowledge and then build on them and add levels of complexity. So this is kind of ground zero where we are now. But you can actually still, once you leave tonight, you should be able to walk away and actually be able to do useful stuff with this if you are that way inclined. All right? So what the shell is a bandit? A bandit is simply this. It's the American term for a slot machine, or like what we like to say in Australia, Australia the pokies. So what the shell then is a multi-armed bandit. It's just several of these machines stacked together such that you have multiple levers to pull. That's all that a multi-armed bandit is. So why are we talking about gambling and slot machines as like the starting point for reinforcement learning? Well, there are many definitions for reinforcement learning, but let's, ex let's examine this specific one. What we are trying to do in reinforcement learning is find the, the best strategy in the face of massive uncertainty, okay? So I'm going to try unpack that a little bit by going through an example. But there's essentially two, two main parts to this, OK? There's finding the optimal strategy in the face of massive uncertainty, right? So let's unpack what that means through another example. Let's say I'm driving on my way to work, OK? So I get up in the morning, I put my clothes on, I have some breakfast and then brush my teeth, walk out the door, a, a bird flies over, you know, it, it flies over and does its business on my head. I have no idea if that's going to happen when I wake up in the morning. Like, I have no idea. Similarly, when I get in the car and drive down my driveway, I have no idea if a car is only going past in the morning. When I keep driving on my way to work, I have no idea if there's going to be, you know, how many cars are going to be at the roundabout that I'm going to have to wait for. Okay? So this. This ties back into this idea that in our world, the world we live in, we're living in an uncertain universe. There's, there's massive uncertainty everywhere. And this is something reinforcement learning tries to address. The second part is the strategy part, which you talked, talked a bit about just before. And if we continue with our driving to work example, if I get up in the morning and I want to get to work, I need to have a strategy on how I'm going to do that, okay? So, one strategy I could adopt is whenever I see a traffic light and it goes red, I could just keep going and go through the traffic lights. You know, that's something I could do. Another strategy I could adopt is if, um, 
I can just go as fast as possible to work. So let's, that, that's another strategy I could adopt. Of course, you could also adopt something boring, just like following the road rules, which I all hope you are doing um, to, to get to work. But the reason, the reason I'm talking about this is in reinforcement learning, we also have a fancy name for this strategy, which I'm talking about. So say I get some information, I, I see the, the traffic light turn red. I have the plan that I'm following to take that information of the red traffic light to the action I'm then going to take, we like to call it, in reinforcement learning, we like to call it a policy. So that's just a fancy name for the strategy or plan that we're taking to take the information that's coming to us and then mapping that to an action. That in reinforcement learning, we like to call it a policy. So think of a strategy or a plan as, as a policy, all right? It's one way of thinking about it. So let's take a look at a couple of people following the policy of not stopping at red traffic lights. So you'll kind of get the idea that these guys adopted the strategy, or like we like to say in reinforcement learning, the policy of when they see a red traffic light, that's the information they see, the strategy they're going to follow, the actions they're going to take, so just keep going. That was the policy they had adopted. So we talked a little bit about uncertainty in the world. We talked a little bit about <coughs> strategies and policies. So how does this then tie back to the multi-armed bandit problem? Well, what we are trying to do in the multi-armed bandit problem is find the best, say we have 24 hours and a certain amount of gold on our back, find the, the best policy, the best way to spend our, go our money once we walk into a casino. And the reason we're trying to do this, the reason this is the sort of starting point of reinforcement learning is that when you walk into a casino and you have all these different slot machines in front of you, each slot machine is tuned slightly differently, right? It has like different parameters to the one next to it. So we have no idea how it's going to respond when I put money into it. Put money into it, I have no idea sort of the, the cash payout I'm going to get. That is the uncertainty bit of the multi-armed bandit problem. But before we get to the epsilon greedy algorithm, so we, we've talked a bit about the multi armed bandit problem. Now we need to un, uh, understand the idea of exploration versus exploitation before you can sort of get an intuitive understanding of how epsilon greedy works. Right. So there's this age old problem in life, and it goes something like this. Let's say that you're on the hunt for a hot date, okay? So what you've done is you got your phone and you've installed Tinder and you go onto the internet and you download some strategies and uh, you know techniques that you think you're gonna try out, some jokes and stuff. You try out these jokes and lo and behold, after some time and some failure, you manage to land yourself a hot date, okay? So you, you, you go and decide to go on a coffee date. It's the, it's the first, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, drink some coffee, and the state's gone on for about 20 minutes, and you're like, this person is just talking about themselves. That's all they've talked about this entire day. So scratch that for the Tinder person. That wasn't very much fun. So you think, oh, I don't know. Tinder's kind of lame. I'm going to go and hit the pub with my mates on Friday night. So it's Friday night. You go out. You have a little bit of liquid courage. And uh, you see your mates talking to, to a girl over there. So you're like, Okay, I'm going to go and approach this person, go to them, you talk to them, you start talking to them. Conversation's going for about five minutes. And you know, you begin to realize this person has really bad breath. I, I don't think I can go uh, much further with this person. So cut that, carry on, having a fun night. It's getting towards the end of the night now and, you know, running out of steam. But over the corner of your shoulder, you notice that somebody's been checking you out all evening. So you, 
managed to muster the last of your courage and you go up to them and you talk to them and you hit it off. Two years later, you get happy, happily married. End of the story. So what has this got to do with reinforcement learning? Why did I just tell you this story? Well, this is one, ex one example of the exploration versus exploitation dilemma, right? So the exploration phase of what I just talked about there was you going out looking for potential partners, right? Going on, on dates. The exploitation phase is when you've chosen the best option, the best option which you think suits you, and you go into exploitation and you start a relationship with that person or whatever. So let's make this a bit more concrete with a few more examples. So let's say, for example, one thing you could be doing is you could be spending your time exploring all, your, all the options available to you in life. You could be looking for other career choices, other jobs you might do. You might go, I don't know, to the Himalayas and do some trekking. Or, so that's exploring. Or, if you find a good that job that suits you, you're enjoying being a data scientist, you're getting job satisfaction out of that. You could spend time exploiting that, you know, and let's say it pays well as well. Spend time exploiting that and getting the maximum reward from this option which you've selected. So that's exploring versus exploiting. One more final example to make this concrete. So if you were a, a stock trader and let's say you've been using random forests, I don't suggest you do this, but say you've been using random forests as your algorithm of choice to do prediction of what the stock market is gonna do. You could spend time using that same algorithm as, the, as your algorithm of choice. Or you could spend time as a, as a machine learning researcher and discover a new one. <laughs> All right, so we've covered the multi-armed bandit problem. And we've also talked a little bit about exploration versus exploitation, okay? Now we're gonna talk about the heart of all of this, the Epsilon Greedy algorithm. So simply put, the Epsilon Greedy algorithm is this. get that? Because when I first saw this, I didn't either. I closed the book and walked off and uh, did something else with my day. So what I'm going to do in this next part of this lecture is break apart what all of this is in sort of piecewise little bits, and hopefully you'll get an understanding of what this means. But I know there's some of you in the audience that can probably look at this and understand it, and if you're one of those people, um, I envy you. All right. So before we jump into what Epsilon Greedy is, we just have to do a quick refresher of this guy. Now, I, I know this is probably going to seem trivial to a lot of you, but just for those of you who <coughs> might not understand this, it's kind of core to understand this before we move on to everything else. So this is called the bell curve. It also has another name which is more technically correct, which is the normal distribution. And it's centered around the average. The key thing about it is it's centered around the average or the mean those of you unfamiliar with this. So we have a bell curve or a normal distribution and it's centered around an average. Okay, so that's a key piece of information you need to keep with you moving forward in this lecture. So let's say for example, I've got my, my bag of a million dollars and two dollar coins. I have 24 hours and I want to go to the casino and try and make as much money back from my from my money as possible okay so I'm a data scientist I'm gonna rock this shit I, I know how to do this so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the casino and lo and behold there's only two slot machines okay so this is kind of a kind of a boring casino I sit down at I sit down at the first slot machine and I start putting put, putting money into it and every time I put money into it and pull the lever I record this information 
record it and I record it. And uh, the casino operators, you know, they are really nice guys. They let me bring my laptop in. So I, I put all this data into a big Excel spreadsheet and I plot it. And lo and behold, this is the result that I get. Okay? So we can see from this graph that around, uh, what do we go to, 44, when I pulled the lever, 40, 44 times when I pulled the lever, I managed to get a payout of around $70, okay? When I pulled the lever around 12 times, I got a payout of $80, okay? That's kind of how this works. And also, this is a really good slot machine because it's normally distributed. So, I mean, this is like you couldn't ask for a bit of slot machine, right? So, I'm finished with slot machine after about four hours, so I jump over to slot machine two, and I sit down, and I start doing the same thing. Put coins in, pull the lever, record this information. And I, and I put all this information into Excel, and lo and behold, I get out this graph. So here we can see that we have two normally distributed bandits or slot machines, right? But when we compare them, we can, I mean, this is kind of trivial, but we can kind of see when we visualize this in a graph, what is going on, we can see that bandit one has the highest payout of $70 as opposed to bandit two, which only has a payout of $65, okay? So here we solve the multi-arm bandit problem using only random sampling. What does that mean? That means I went into the, into the casino, I pulled the levers, gathered some data, just pulled them at random. When I plotted them, I was able to sort of establish which bandit was the winner, which slot machine was the winner, by taking, seeing what the average payout was of that slot machine. Does that make sense? You guys, you guys with me on this? Yep. Cool. All right, but where does the, we, we've talked a bit about like the random part, the, the exploration part of this. Where does the exploitation phase come into this? And that's where Epsilon comes in. So Epsilon is just this symbol. For those of you in the audience who might not know, it's just a Greek letter, so don't be afraid of this. But what Epsilon does is actually really, really interesting, okay? So the next slide is a bit of math. So bear with me on it, because I'll sort of explain what's going on, okay? So epsilon is simply this. It's the probability of our exploration, it's the probability of our, of our exploitation, and it's equal to one. That's all very well and good. Well, what epsilon really is, is that you can kind of think of it as a volume knob. It starts off at one, and what it's controlling is the ratio of our exploration to the ratio of our exploitation. Does that make sense? So it's done. Epsilon is the kind of thing that's selecting between the months of exploring we're doing to the months until eventually, once we've found a good solution, to start exploiting that solution, right? So to make this more concrete, when epsilon is equal to one, exploration is maximized. What does that mean? Anyone? Correct. Exactly correct. So when epsilon is equal to one, you're choosing actions at random. You're just randomly sampling the options that are, are available to you. In this case, when you're talking about the multi-armed bandit problem, there's only two, and, and in this very particular example, we only have two bandits to choose from. We're just choosing those actions at random. But you can see already that, that like, you can move this problem away from just being bandits to something else. Some other thing where you don't know the distribution and you're just randomly sampling it. So that's when epsilon is equal to one. When epsilon is equal to zero, exploitation is maximized. Uh, Elijah, what, what do you think that means? Um, you mean in terms of the probabilities? No, so when epsilon is equal to zero, uh, Exploitation is maximized. What do you think this last this last sentence means? Probability of exploration is zero. Is that right? 
So, correct. Your, expo your exploration has gone to zero. Yeah. And what, you, what you're doing is you're choosing the best action that you've discovered so far, right? So if you have more than one bandit, so we have two bandits, we're gonna choose the best action that we think is gonna to lead to the highest reward when epsilon is equal to zero. Are all of you guys following this so far? Just, just a question. So sure. you've got a sum, the previous slide has some of the probabilities equal to epsilon. Yep. But how do you get that ratio? How do you get that should be ratio or something? Sure, sure. So we'll get to that in a second. Oh. That's that's the next part. Okay. So the very next part is this is all very well and good. So this is, we're just defining, just, this is just a definition of one and zero for what epsilon is. But the next question is, okay, how do we control epsilon, right? And again, bear with me on this, a little piece of math, but it's not really that complicated. We um, can, our epsilon, our volume knob, we can control it using uh, any mathematical function. That's the key thing here, right? So we take one, minus some mathematical function, and that we can use that as the, the mathematical function is the thing we're using to sort of scale epsilon, right? But again, as a reminder, just to keep hammering this into you guys, epsilon equals one, exploration is maximized. When epsilon equals zero, exploitation is maximized. So how do we go about choosing this function, okay? so. For this example, we're gonna, you can use any function, you can like use a logistic curve, but for this example that I'm about to walk through with you guys, you can use the most complex function in the world, we're gonna use a straight line. <coughs> right. So, it's important to note here, just rewinding a little bit, that f of x, you can kind of think of this as time. There should be t in there, okay? So, here we have, on the x-axis, we have time, so this is moving forward in time. And here, here, f of x, our function, this line, is just increasing, right? From zero to one, if you can't see that. Just as a reminder, our little equation is this. So when we take one minus this function, what do you think happens? So exploration is maximum x zero. You do get another line, which is the opposite. Exactly, correct. So when you take one minus a straight line, you get the offset. And uh, what we have here, so this is, this is our function, this guy, the straight line, and this is epsilon, the result of minusing this function from one. And as you can see, this is exactly the kind of thing we want because again, epsilon's our little volume knob that we're using to control the rate, like the sort of ratio between exploration and exploitation and we're starting off at one our exploration is maximized just like we'd like in this problem and as time progresses epsilon is decreasing where eventually goes to zero and hopefully by now we've found our best solution we've been sampling the whole time and hopefully we've found our best solution okay so let's pull this all together now with sort of one more animated example just to sort of uh, illustrate all the sort of concepts we've learned tonight and how, how, this, um, how epsilon really essentially works. So just as a reminder, epsilon, which was just our function before, the straight line, kind of think of it as a volume knob, okay? Controlling the ratio of, between exploration and exploitation. All right, so let's walk through this example. So we're back in our casino again and we go up to, we start off with epsilon set to one, and we sample banded one, and that gives us some data, gives us a reward. We sample banded two, that gives us some data. We sample banded one, that gives us some data, and we sample banded two, that gives us some data, <coughs> right? All the while this is going on, whilst we're doing our sampling, epsilon is decreasing. Okay? It's decreasing like a little volume knob. So we repeat this process, we sample, get some more data, start building up our little distributions, because remember, the whole point of this is we don't know the, the, the distribution that could exist in the slot machine. We're trying to find it via sam sampling. That's one of the key ideas here. So we sample, get some more data. 
the whole time this is going on, epsilon is decreasing. Sample, get some more data, sample, so on and so forth. Epsilon is decreasing. As a caveat here, and we'll get to why this is in a, in a, in a second, you never want epsilon to go to, to zero. You kind of always want to be exploring a little bit, but we'll talk about why that is in a bit. But anyways, so we've gathered some data, and these are our distributions which we talked about before. And we can see that this one has an average payout of 70, and this one has an average payout of 65. And that's pretty much how epsilon greedy works. So by sampling, by sampling our, 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 our problem, which in this case is the multi on banner problem, we sample it, we get some data, we build up these distributions, and then we find that the distribution with, with the highest return, which in this case is band of one. All right, so that's the multi arm banded problem, epsilon greedy exploration versus exploitation. We're now gonna talk a little bit about OpenAI Gym and why it's important. So OpenAI Gym was released about two and a half years ago to little, to little fanfare. But, but in the reinforcement learning world, this was a huge thing, okay? So the reason it was a huge thing was because prior to Jim, there was no common interface that gives you standardized inputs and outputs for doing re reinforcement learning research. So what this means, I'll take it back to another example. Way back in 2009, when I was doing my little research for my honors thesis, I had to code up my own environment in, in C, and then, uh, plug in my little reinforcement learning algorithm. But if I was to try and compare my results to some, some researcher, say in China, it wouldn't be very good because we had like no standard to sort of like compare them against. It would just be my curve versus his, but all the underlying variables would be different. So we're, how OpenAI tried to solve this problem is by providing a standardized API with common inputs and outputs focused on uh, reinforcement learning, on the reinforcement learning framework. We'll also get to that in a couple of seconds. So, so now, now we can compare the results from if now in 2018, if I want to do some really basic research in reinforcement learning, saying Jim, it exposes like a whole bunch of several interfaces, such as there's a box 2D environments in there, there is uh, Atari 2600 games, like the ones I showed you before, in there that you can play with, there is, um, there's a whole bunch of new ones with, with robotics. But the, the key idea is they've provided all these common environments and they've wrapped them in such a way that they provide the same inputs and outputs that you can use for your experiments. And we're gonna be making extensive use of OpenAI Gym uh, throughout the rest of this course. Right, so I promised you we'd get to an exercise and that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. So we're gonna try wrap everything we've learned about right now into an exercise, and hopefully um, that'll give you the intuition of how Epsilon Greedy is working. So this is what your screen should look like. Has everybody got that on their screen? Does everyone understand that they need to run it in a Jupyter Notebook? Yeah, right. So, thanks, man. Um, yeah, so we want to be running this uh, homework exercise live in your browser. Uh, we're using a tool called Colaboratory. The key fundamental thing to take away from this is that. This is the front end. The back end is on a server somewhere with a, um, quite a powerful CPU, a whole bunch of RAM. You can connect your, your Google Drive to this as well. So yeah, it's a very powerful tool. Yeah, the link I got was just to the actual notebook file of the ColaB uh, when I clicked on it. So I had to upload it to my computer. Oh, true. <coughs> Weird. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
All right, everyone, so the way you solve this problem is, is like following. You click this link, there, it opens up this thing, uh, but then this little thing appears up here, right? You click that and go open with co-laboratory. Yep, 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 so that's intentional. <laughs> I don't want you modifying my pristine notebook. But uh, no, in all seriousness, what you do next is you go file, save a copy in Drive. So yeah, come here and go save a copy in Drive. So we're going to be making extensive use of collabs throughout the duration of this course. I'll show you why in a couple of seconds. So by the way, you can update the setting as well if you want to save this, if you want to save your outputs over there. But yeah, the reason that collabs is so great is it also gives you access to a free GPU, which is a Tesla K80. Uh, and you get t 12 hours access to that before the notebooks reset. But you can download the weights from your neural network if you have a training one and carry on going. So that's just a hint. So yeah, all right. So let's 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 start getting through this this first exercise. Have you all got it open on your laptops? Right. So so for those of you who who haven't used uh, a Jupyter notebooks before, this is Colabs. It is just a fork of the Jupyter notebooks project. And the way it works is you have, you know, text blocks and you have code cell blocks. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we want to do, uh, code cell blocks, you can run. You can actually run the code live in your browser. And in this case, we have a, a free v VM on the other side of the earth some way doing the compute for us. And you can also, if you want, using um, wiki markdown syntax, you can write notes. So that's, that's, that's essentially what a Jupyter notebook is. So what you want to do here is first you want to connect to uh, an instance somewhere. So the first thing you do is click connect. Okay. So you should all have a little green arrow next to your connected box here. So unfortunately, uh, Colabs does not come with Jim pre-installed, so we have to run this command by, click, by clicking this little play button that runs the command live in your browser. And uh, I've put some fancy syntax here to mute the outputs, so you, there's some stuff being generated. Once we know that a command is executed successfully in a Jupyter notebook by when a little numbers appeared next to it, so you can see that these commands haven't been executed yet, and they don't have numbers next to them. This one has. So, yep, this ran correctly. The next, we've, in, we've, in, we've installed the library. Now we want to import it into the memory. So we run the next command. Okay, so like I talked about in the lecture, 
Jim gives us this, uh, it's a wrapper that gives us an interface to common inputs and outputs of a whole bunch of different environments. So to get a list of those environments that it gives us access to, click this play button, and it prints out a list of all the environments that you, in your own time, both after this, tonight, and going forward into the future, you can play around with all these different environments. There's a lot here, there's a lot. So just as an example, if I can move this across. Doesn't seem to want to go. There we go. So we've got uh, Carpole, you guys are gonna get quite familiar with that guy. Um, Lunar Lander, it's quite a famous one as well, you know, trying to like land a little thing on the moon. Bipedal Walker, that's a really good one to wants to get to the advanced stage of reinforcement learning to have a play with that guy. Um, you know, and then there's several other ones from uh, Atari. But you get the point, there's a whole bunch of different environments that OpenAI Jim gives us a common in interface with. Right. So, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't give us a multi-armed bandit environment, so we're going to have to download that off somebody's Git repository and install it. So just run the next two, two commands. Alright, so we now should have a multi arm banded environment installed in our memory to play around with by clicking this one. Okay, so again, in our example we gave in the lecture just before, we had two bandits that we're looking at. In this little problem set, we're going to be looking at 10 bandits. So I know this picture only shows seven, but it sort of gets the point across. We're going to have 10 different slot machines, 10 different options, which have hidden distributions, which we don't know yet. By a sampling, we're going to sample them, gather data, and try to figure out which one of our bandits pays out the highest return. Okay? So that's the, that's the multi-arm bandit in a, pro, in a nutshell. And if any of you guys are more like you learn through reading, there's plenty of notes here to walk you through this as well. If you're not catching anything I've said. So it's our goal to try and determine which bandit out of the 10 pays out the most. So the first thing we want to do is we want, we want to make uh, an environment variable uh, to, to hold our environment. In this case, we are creating a 10 arm bandit environment. So by running this command, we are creating a 10 arm bandit environment. Pretty, pretty straightforward. All right, so this next part of code is, uh, doesn't have any machine learning in it yet. That's the thing you need to know. But I'm we're gonna run this, and then we're gonna walk through its outputs to sort of understand what's going on um, at a very high level for OpenAI Gem. This is the sort of common interface, and the common inputs and outputs that we talked about earlier. So let's run this. So it should print out about five times, I believe. So we're gonna take apart, we're gonna take apart each sort of line of code here and see what's going on under the hood. So we talked, we alluded to this earlier, but unlike uh, the other sort of genres of machine learning, reinforcement learning is kind of in its own little category. And we'll, we'll deep dive into, in a, in a future lecture, we'll actually deep dive into why that is. But for now, it's, it's good to understand that reinforcement learning is kind of this framework, and it's this framework that's on the screen right now, right? So I'll explain it, and then we'll see what, how it's implemented in the code. So you have an agent, in this case it's a human brain, of course it's an, a human brain doing machine learning, and your agent, this, this is where you usually substitute your algorithm, your agent takes an action. In the case of space invaders, there are, I believe, five actions available to you, you can go down, uh, no, sorry, there's three. You can either go left, go right, or shoot. So there's three actions that are available to you. You take an action, you feed your action into your environment, which is the Atari uh, game console here, that produces two things. At this step, it produces two things. So it produces a reward, which is fed back to your agent, and then it produces 
the, the next state, the next bit of information that your reinforcement learning algorithm is going to take in and then interpret and then do something. So it takes the information in uh, based on what your algorithm is, makes it just takes another action, which is fed into the environment, which produces a reward and a new state, and this goes on and on. And this is reinforcement learning in a nutshell. Okay? So let's see how Jim implemented this little diagram uh, below. So this is pretty much explaining what we just talked about before. So we, we, we created our, uh, our, our environment and that's held in the EMV variable. The very first thing we need to do, so say you wake up in the morning, you get some light that comes into your eyes and that's the very first piece of information you get to start making decisions for the rest of the day. We, we need to do the same thing with Jim, so we need to reset it and that provides our very first observation. So again, observation is a technical word. We also call this state in reinforcement learning. It has two names, observation or state. And what that is, is like in the, in the diagram just before a state, one example of a state is just this very image here. You know, state number two might be the image after it. State number three might be the image after that. To make, or we can also call it observation. It means the same thing. So, the very first thing we do is we reset our environment. So, in reinforcement learning, every playthrough of a game or, or simulation through an environment is called an episode. That's the technical name we give it, right? In our little loop that we did prior, we did five loops, so five episodes. And uh, what we did was we, so yeah, first, first as a caveat, we are dealing with the 10 armed multi amp armed bandit problem, so there's not two, there's 10. And what that means, okay, that's very, it's a very crucial thing that we understand this. We've got 10 bandits that we can pull, so that we can get information on, that we can sample. But uh, we can prove that this is the case by running this line of code. And what this does, again, don't, be, don't, don't freak out or anything. The action space is just essentially an array, you know, a table of all the actions that are available to us for that specific environment, right? So for the 10 armed bandit problem, how many actions do you think are available to us? Anyone? For the two armed bandit problem? And if for space invaders? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So if we're playing space invaders, I'll action space will be an array of three, starting at zero, obviously. So we can prove that by uh, running this line of code, and it comes back as, funny enough, 10. All right, so the next, just to again stress, we haven't done any machine learning yet. We aren't doing anything. We're just walking through what, how Jim works. So the next thing is, we take an action. This is usually where you would plug in your like reinforcement learning algorithm or, or whatever. So that's this line of code here. But in this example, all we are doing is we are sampling the action space. So to go back to this thing here. So all we are doing is we're saying at random, give me an action to take. We're sampling it just at random. Okay. We get it, we, t we take an action, that's very good. So it's gonna be some number between zero and nine, okay? Now what we do next is the interesting part. We take our action and we feed it into our environment variable which we created earlier via the step function. And that produces these things here, the new state and the new reward from, from our action. So again, <coughs> We get our brand new state from waking up in the morning. We decide to take an action. The action is fed into our environment, which produces two new things, a reward and the new state, which is then fed back in and we carry on, carry on going. Just this, over and over and over. So there's two um, other things that, that uh, Jim produces. It produces done and info. 
we don't need to know about these yet, so just ignore them. If you are, you know, I think a lot of you guys are, as a caveat as well, we looked at a lot of your code to get into this course. We actually looked at all your coded up examples. So there was quite a few um, interesting answers to there. But um, yeah. But so uh, yeah, so you could literally just do this. You can ignore the, the this as an input. Output, sorry. All right, okay, so this is essentially the final piece of the puzzle, and then I can hand this over to you guys to sort of code up in the, in the next 10 minutes, <laughs> or in your own time at home. But, okay, so the last piece of the puzzle is this thing called the reward average sampling learning rule, okay? So the epsilon greedy algorithm is kind of a synthesis between two ideas. You're combining uh, a purely exploratory agent. Now, if you had the case of an exploratory agent, just purely exploratory, it would just randomly sample all your all your actions that are available to you forever. Just um, that's all it would do. If you had a purely greedy agent, it would you know it would find. If it, it would be like a dragon. It would find like a pot of gold it would find and just sit on it and just sit there forever. Like it would, it would find one option and just sit on it. So the epsilon greedy algorithm is kind of like a synthesis between these two ideas. But like we use epsilon like, as a, like, like we talked about previously as a volume up to control the ratio between these two things. So one way of saying that is like we take an epsilon chance at doing an exploratory action, okay? And the greedy mechanism helps us sort of focus in on the best option that we've found so far. But say we've got these 10 bandits. How do we then assign the idea? The con how do we teach the machine the concept of value? How do we say, okay, this, this bandit over here has a higher value than this bandit over here, okay? And we do it via this algorithm. Or this little piece of, piece of math. So I'm going to walk through what that is. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's say we have again our 10 arm banded problem. Um, we want to, to create an array that holds 10 variables because we want to like keep track of of how well this one is doing, how well banded number two is doing, how well banded number three is doing, etc. Okay. And we call, okay, so the, the, the name DeepQN, the Q comes from this. It's formally, its formal name is quality, okay? It's kind of a lame name, but anyways, that's what they decided to, to name it. And N is the, the amount of times we have visited that particular option, or in this case, slot machine bandit. So say I go to slot machine one and pull it three times, N is three. If I go to slot machine two and pull it two times, n is two. But we need to keep track of this separately for each option that's available to us, okay? Now, if you're dealing with a problem where you have many different options, many different actions you can take, um, and the problem's gonna run for a while, you can quickly see that this algorithm, or if, you, if you're having to like remember every single reward for like, I visit this, I get a reward, remember that, revisit the, the slot machine, re remember the reward that came out, you'd quickly run out of memory, even with today's computers, okay? So we use a, a little bit of mathematical trickery and get to this version of the equation. It's, it's, just the, it's exactly the same thing. But all we are doing here is uh, essentially compressing down, instead of having to remember every single reward we've ever, we've ever like, encountered, what we do is we take the, 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 the next Q value, so say we visit a state and we want to generate a new Q value for that, the next Q value, we take the old Q value, uh, we, take, we take the reward that we got from visiting this new state, minus the old Q value, um, and then divide that by the, the amount of times we've, we've visited that bandit or, this, or that option, that's, that state. Okay, so I've written out what this equation is here in code over there, right? 
Because that's like the English version of what this is doing. So if, you get, if you've just understood what I've just said, you can implement Epsilon greedy right now. But I'll walk you through a little bit more, and then it's up to you guys to implement, implement this by yourself. <coughs> okay, so first we have to import NumPy. I really hope you all know what that is, but it's a, <laughs> it's a numerical computation array library that's very powerful uh, in, in Python. We then need to randomly seed our environment, just like, you know, uh, so we, again, we have these 10 bandits, and when we randomly seed them, we're just shuffling them. That's all that we're doing there. We, we're shuffling them so that we can start sampling them to figure out which is the best one. So we seed our environment, we shuffle, we shuffle which bandit is which. All right, so time to write some code. All right, so we've talked about, about how many bandits are, are in this example. How many do you think that is? Ten. Okay. Ten. So write that answer into the, into the notebook. Yeah. You guessed it already, it is 10. We then need to set up a queue table, you know, a table that's gonna keep track of how each bandit is performing. There's 10 options. So the first, we, we haven't sampled anything yet, so we have to initialize it with zeros. That, that should be intuitive to you. So we haven't done any, we haven't done any measuring of how well these bandits are performing. So we just set, we just say, okay, they all are zero at the start. All right, so the next little part is we need to make an end table. So we need, not only do we need to keep track of how well this band is performing, but we also need to, like bandit one, how well is bandit one performing? We also need to keep track of how many times we visited it. We call this like a, an end table, right? Number of times we visited a table. So complete the next line of code. <coughs> Just as a hint, we should be filling up our end table with, um, should be initialized off with ones, just to just stop a divide by zero error in this formula. If you put zero in here, it won't work, so we have to fill it up with one. <coughs> guessed it already. It's this. So in the lecture we talked about scaling epsilon, right, with a, another function. We're not going to do that in this example. It's actually too, too easy. You don't need to. We can solve it without that. We're going to use a fixed epsilon. So we're going to set it to 0 0.9. All right, so below I've written the pseudocode for how you can go about implementing the epsilon greedy algorithm. So again, for those of you who might not know what that is, pseudocode is just essentially a cooking recipe for how to create a bit of uh, an algorithm in computer science. And uh, for every single thing here, I've sort of giving you the ingredients to create it. So say for example, I don't know, say you wanted to create a loop that looped a thousand times. You go down here and say, oh, here is an example of where I created a loop to, to loop 10 times, and so on and so forth. So for each one of these things, there's sort of like the ingredients on how to implement it below. And uh, yeah, that should be enough for you to guys to implement epsilon greedy. So, 
start coding up your answer over here.